want to continue on in the, in the aspect of the C, the commitment uh, part. We looked at, this is where the Lord had me to back up instead of just talking about the commitment that a couple needs to make or a family needs to make. Let's look at the commitment that God has made. God has made a commitment to people and to process and to purpose. I won't go into all of this in detail uh, uh, right here at this juncture. Uh, but when we looked at God's commitment to people, remember we talked about the parable of the lost sheep and we talked about the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost son. So see the level of commitment that God makes to people. Then uh, last week we started talking about God's commitment to process. And we looked at John 15, and we're going to go through this again, one verses 1 through 2 and verses 5 through 7, about God's commitment to the process of causing us to become fruitful. And we're going to eventually, we're going to look at God's commitment to purpose uh, from Psalm 33, where it says, where it talks about God's purpose being fulfilled throughout generations. And also in Proverbs 19, where it talks about God's purpose prevailing even over the plans of man. So got a lot that we're going to be looking at as we look at uh, the commitment uh, that God has made to us. Remember when we were talking about the uh, commitment to the process of becoming fruitful, as we looked at John 15. And that says, very, very familiar passage of scripture, says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Wow. I love this particular scripture because uh, it's, it has a lot of controversy in it. Uh, and the controversy is this, not many people understanding what this word takes away mean. Any, have any of you heard or been taught, you don't have to raise your hand, that if you don't bear any fruit, God's going to cut you off. God's going to cut you off if you don't bear any fruit. Anybody heard that before? <laughs> and so you can probably tell I spend a lot of time constantly uh, refuting those arguments and those teachings because it does not produce the confidence and the security that believers must have in order to live this life and fulfill the will of God. I put it to you, God gave it to me in this thought yesterday. Would you send out United States soldiers to go and fight for their country if they had to constantly question their citizenship every day. What soldiers would be out there fighting for this country if they didn't know from one day to the next if President Obama was going to cut their citizenship from one day to the next? Do you think we'd have a very successful army <laughs> or Marines or Air Force? You cannot send people into a war and a fight if they constantly don't know if they're going to be backed up by the country that they're fighting for. And that's what we teach some branches of the church, and many of us have been, have been taught under, under some of those uh, types of uh, pastors and groups, that constantly our citizenship is on the line. And whatever we don't get right, Again, we're cut off. So we've read this scripture, and the New King James Version says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may, be more, that it may bear more fruit. That word, and that's why I love going back to the Greek language, that word takes away is arie, uh, which, whose root word is are, is ie ro, and that root word, means lifts up. It means lift up. So when you read this scripture, uh, let me just finish this definition. A primary root to lift up, by implication, it means to take up or to take away or away. Figuratively, it means to raise, to keep in suspense, just like they do the, the branches on a vine. They suspend it. They hold it up. They'll tie it to the trellis and it's suspended and held up. So um, many, many people have, uh, have really misinterpreted that particular scripture. In fact, I found, I love going and exploring stuff on the internet, 
And you can see this little diagram that I found that shows uh, a vine. Actually, see, this is how we've been taught to think of this. The, when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. See these branches, the, see these things extending off to the side? We have been taught to think that these things extending off to the side are, are the vine. And these little shoots are the branches. And so when these little shoots are not pr producing any grapes, any fruit, you cut it off. But here is what the scripture means. I love the diagram. The vine is this. Actually, the whole thing is thought of as being the vine. But in particular, Jesus was really referring to, I'm the trunk. I am the part from which all of these longer part, the branches extend. And along the branches are these shoots that extend off. And the shoots is where the grapes come from. So he's not talking about I'm the branches and I'll cut off the shoots. No, I'm the trunk, the base of this entire plant. And you are the branches that have several Several long, because the branches parts of a vine can extend long, long distance away from the trunk. So he wasn't saying, I'm going to cut off. Now when you see the picture, it makes sense, doesn't it? He's not saying, I'm going to cut off these branches. This is not referred to as, the, I'm not going to cut, I'm going to lift up. And I showed this picture over here. So you can see how they extend and they are tied to a trellis. I'm going to lift them up and tie them to the trellis. So if I've got branches that are unfruitful, he don't cut it off. There's very little chance that an entire long extended branch, the entire branch would be unfruitful. You're going to have grapes along the entire branch. Isn't that amazing when you actually see it? I love this. So he wasn't saying I'm going to cut it off. He said I'm going to lift it up. I'm going to move it. Wow. The root word, uh, airo, has basically, it has, it has four basic meanings. Uh, it means to lift up or pick up. Number two has a figurative meaning. It means to lift up like lifting one's eyes or lifting your voice. Number three definition, to lift up with the added thought of lifting up in order to carry away. And the fourth definition is the one that people ought that the scholars and most of the people picked up on. That means to remove. And even then when it's saying remove, from a vine dresser standpoint, he's not meaning remove the branch. I'm going to remove stuff off of the branch. Anything that's keeping this branch from being fruitful, I'm going to remove it. Woo! Doesn't it free you up today? Lord, you're not looking for every reason in the world to cut me off. <laughs> this is what keeps believers constantly in this state. Am I saved? Am I not? Am I okay? Am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? And that's because we take these words and they'll add English definition or they'll take one definition of four part meaning words. Actually, this was describing an entire process. Jesus was talking about an entire process. Isn't that great to see that? So, uh, I guess. Let me, let me back up before I get to this next part. I must read this. Um, many scholars uh, interpret the word I-E-R-E as lifts up in this verse. They, the, they note that in, in at least 80, at least 8 out of its 24 uses in John, the same term is used with the sense of lifting and not in a judgmental way. The same word was used in, in various places in John. And the same term is used, it's always used in the sense of lifting things up, not judgmental. This was never meant, when Jesus made this statement, this was never meant as a statement to be uh, judgmental. That I'm pronouncing a final verdict upon someone who is not producing. This was meant to be a word of encouragement. If a branch is unfruitful, I'm going to lift it up. God's not going around looking for every single excuse and reason I can to cut people down and cut people off. Wow. I just thought I'd repeat this one again today because sometimes it's good to just to hear it again. To hear it again. 
Jesus said, my father is the vine dresser. I saw this video clip of a pastor who went to go visit a vineyard and he visited a master vine dresser. And the master vine dresser said, uh, even when the pruning season takes place, and that's not all the time, he said pruning only takes place uh, in between January and February. So again, even that, pruning is not all, all the time. It's a seasonal thing that happens. And even then, he said, the only one who prunes the vines is the father. This particular vine dresser, he said, my dad is 80-something years old, and he still is the only one. Even though he deeded this whole vineyard over to me, and I'm running the business, still, my dad is the only one who prunes these vines. So when Jesus said that, he was talking about just regular, what was to them was just common, everyday occurrence. Only the Father does the pruning, and his purpose for pruning is never for destruction. Ain't that good to know, y'all? Come on, just take a moment and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Fallen vines in Palestine were lifted with meticulous care and allowed to heal. You got to understand the context in which Jesus was saying this. In Palestine at this time, it was just a normal thing that when vines fell, that they would meticulous, would care, carefully lift them and put them back up on the trellis and tie them back up. Wow. Just changes everything, doesn't it, to know that God wasn't talking about, I'm cutting you off if you're not fruitful. Wow. Uh, very important point. Uh, I e-ray that particular Greek word, um, it didn't have another word that's very close to it that spelled A-I-R-E-O. Remember, this word we just read is A-I-R-E-I -E with the root word of A-I-R-O. If this, if this Jesus had used this particular word A-I-R-E-O, that word would have meant to cut off and take away. But he did not use the word for cutting things off. He used the particular Greek word for lifting things up. Very important. Wow. So I know it brings the question when you hear a pastor say something like this. So what about the next part of that verse where he says, uh, and I'll read it. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. The word abide, just for starters, the word abide means to, it's, it's not a, it's a, it's a three-part word. It means to become one, to continue in, and dwell. To become one, continue, and dwell. So he who becomes one with me, continues in me, dwells in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not become one with me, got to catch the significance of this, because we're not talking about a person which we've always been taught that this is talking about somebody who got saved and then got cut off. No, Jesus ain't talking about somebody who became one with him and then gets cut off. If anyone does not become one with me and continue in me and dwell in me, then here's the key. He is cast out as a branch. Doesn't mean he's a cast off branch because you was never part of me. That's why he, then the phrase changes. He says he becomes cast off as if though he was a branch that's withered. Because unfruitful branches are not withered. Very important. Hope you're catching what I'm saying. Unfruitful branches are not withered. They're just unfruitful. Why is a branch withered? Because it has no life. A withered branch has no life. That's why it's withered. An unfruitful branch has life. It just ain't doing what it's supposed to do. 
So when he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. This is someone who has never been a part of the vine. Because abide means to become one with. You've never been one with me. You've never dwelled with me. That's why the Lord, even in the day of judgment, and there will be people who will stand before him and say, I did this in your name and that in your name. And the word of the Lord is, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. What's the phrase? I never knew you. And the word knew is not head knowledge. It's the same word knew that's used when it said Adam knew his wife. Personal, intimate relationship. I never knew you. Wow. Isn't that confidence? Gives you confidence. And I'm not in that position. You've got to see yourself. I'm not in that position. I'm not someone that does not have any relation that's cut off from God. And even when there are seasons and times that I'm not bearing fruit like I'm supposed to, that doesn't cut me off. What he does is he lifts me up. He puts me in the position to make me fruitful. And all the time they're lifting, we don't like. We don't like the lifting because he starts making it uncomfortable for us. Because just like those plants, you're used to being in a certain position, growing a certain way, and having things be a certain routine and all that, and God just messes it all up. You ain't being fruitful at this job, so what I'm going to do? I'm going to let them fire you, and I'm going to move you. God, not my job! <laughs> hear me clearly today sometimes God's been moving us and doing stuff and we didn't understand he was fulfilling this scripture he was moving us on the vine he was moving us on the trellis so that we could become fruitful we weren't bearing fruit where we were and so he had to move us even for those of you that are now coming to Urban Life Church you know why part of the reason why God has moved you here Stop bearing fruit where you were. Or your time of fruit bearing was over there. And he wanted to move you to another place to bear fruit. So what does he do? I'm going to move you. I'm going to shift you on the trellis. And I'm going to tie you up there. And this is uncomfortable. This ain't what I'm used to. You find yourself saying, eh, this is weird. I don't like this. But I got to do this. Why? Because I need to position you to where you're going to be fruitful. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it so good to know that's what Jesus was talking about? We make every single issue, and that's what I know that we've done it through the years. I've been guilty myself as pastors. We made everything an issue of whether people are going to heaven or hell. And this was not even a discussion about heaven or hell. He was talking about fruitfulness coming forth out of his people and the lengths and the depths that I'll go to to get my fruit. Because God is committed. He's committed to people. And he's committed to the process that he will take us through in order for us to bear fruit. Wow. So you need to hear this clearly. Make a note for yourself somewhere. It's not failure to bear fruit that causes remover, removal. It's not failure to bear fruit that causes removal. It's failure to abide. Failure to abide, which means failure to become one with Christ that causes removal. Wow. Unfruitful branches are not withered. Only disconnected or never connected branches are withered. Whoa. Make a note for yourself. So now I know. So I don't have to worry. He doesn't want us worried and concerned about if whether we're going to heaven or not. I, I, you probably hear me preaching this for 20 years if the Lord say the same. If I'm still here and we're all still here. <laughs> if Jesus hadn't come back by that time. But I'll keep constantly preaching about the confidence that God wants us to have in him. He's confident in us. I'll show you that in a, me, in a minute. But I'm, I wish that we as pastors would stop preaching to the fear of believers that they're going to be cut off. 
and start addressing the reality that here's the way the Lord expresses it throughout Scripture. You're either in or you're out. There is no in-between. That's really, that's really how Jesus presents things. You're either in or you out. There is no in and wavering and wandering back and forth of whether you, no, no. You're either in this or you're out of it. Uh, and the problem that we have is that there are people who appear to be in, uh, but they're not. But even then, the Lord doesn't want us to waste time trying to pull up or get rid of all the folks that are not really in. Now, where did I get that from? Remember, we talked about uh, the, the process of the successful seeds and, the, and really the wheat and the tares. Remember this parable. Another parable, parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold seed, sold good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares or weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Here's an important thing to understand. Listen to this phrase. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let both grow together until the harvest. Why is that important? Because God is so confident in the seed that he has sown. He did not intend for us to build ministry based upon trying to go and get out all the tares. And he didn't intend for us as believers to constantly be wondering, am I a weed or am I wheat? Which one am I? Am I going to be uprooted when God makes it? No, you, you, you were sown into the field. His. Now, where am I getting that from? Because in Jesus' explanation, Jesus said, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. I'm talking to, I'm talking to the sons of the kingdom today. Okay. I can say sons and daughters. That's why I made that statement that you're either in or out. You're either a son of the kingdom or you're not. So he didn't want you wondering, am I going to be pulled out as one of the tares? But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So you're either one or the other. You're not a son of the kingdom always wondering, am I going to be switched and turned into a son of the wicked? I'm going to slip and fall and become one of the sons. of the, No, it's here's the parable. The Lord sows sons of the kingdom into the world. And the enemy sows his wicked sons. And God is so confident of the seed that he has sown. He said, let them all grow together. Let them all grow together. I'm confident in what I sowed. Now you know I keep saying, so my confidence is because I'm looking at how confident God is in what he sold. It ain't about me and you, but he said, let them grow together so that we don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen at the end when the separation and the distinction is made. Aren't you glad today? Come on, say praise God. <laughs> Verse 39, the enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that, are, that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. What does that say? 
That's why I love reading the word. The son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wow, aren't you glad to hear the word today? Thank you, Lord. So God is so confident of the success of his seed that he's not worried about what the enemy has sown into his field. God allows the wicked to grow side by side with what he has sown. Don't waste time and energy trying to get rid of the weeds that are growing around you because harvest day is coming. Another word to expressing it because judgment day is coming. Separation day is coming. But he doesn't want us worried about the separation day. What's the separation day about? Uh, some of you were here when I talked about this a little bit more in depth on our New Year's Eve uh, celebration. Uh, Romans, the 14th chapter. Let me get to that. Because I want you to have further assurance that as I talk about Judgment Day so that you don't have to fear about your life and future. From this day forward, I don't want you to have to ever be afraid of harvest, to be afraid of Judgment Day. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? Where do I stand with God? Um, Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 10 through 12 says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians uh, 5 verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now in the context, it's clear that both of these scriptures are referring to Christians, not unbelievers, because these are letters that were written to the church. So he's not talking about unbelievers. He's saying every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged. Now we've got to take a look at, now, what are we being judged for? <laughs> I want you to be confident today. I want nobody to walk out of here afraid of judgment day. What's going to happen on judgment day? Am I going to make it into heaven or not? What is the judgment for for believers at the end? The judgment seat of Christ does not determine salvation. The judgment seat is not about determining if whether we make it into heaven or not. That was already determined for us by Christ's sacrifice. That's already been determined. That's already been determined by Christ's sacrifice. 1 John 1, 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Everybody familiar with this scripture? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, or only begotten, that whoever believes in him, what does it say? Shall not perish, but what? Have eternal life to life. That's guaranteed. That's his word. So what are we standing before the judgment seat of Christ for? Here's Paul writing to the church of Corinth and saying, now we all going to stand before the Lord. And he's talking to believers. So believers are not standing before the Lord, or we're not going to stand before the Lord to be, de to be determined if whether we make it into heaven or not. Romans 8, 1 says, therefore, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that say? No condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. At the judgment seat of Christ, believers are going to be rewarded based on how faithfully they served. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is for us. We're not coming to stand before the Lord to be determined if whether we're making it into heaven or not. The judgment seat is where believers are rewarded based on how faithfully they served Christ. Wow. And some of the things that we're going to be 
judged on are how we obeyed the Great Commission. As you go into the world, make disciples. We're going to be judged on uh, how victorious we were over sin, how we controlled our tongues, how we demonstrated Christ in the church, in our marriage, how we raised and taught our children and family, how we managed our household finances, how we obeyed or honored our parents, how we worked for or respected our employers. The list can go on, but it's not determining if whether you make it into heaven or not. This is now, how did you live after you received so great a salvation? Wow, isn't that great?